Uh, most of you I've met, I think. Some of you I haven't. I'm Bob Traub. I've been in the club for about 15 years now. Uh, been at doing astronomy for about that long. I uh, got started in astrophotography about 12 years ago, and I've made all the mistakes that you guys are struggling with right now. I've probably made some more that you haven't but made, but you're also making mistakes I haven't made too. So we're going to talk a little bit about getting started in astrophotography. And I think there's a big tendency for people to feel like there's this great big mountain that they have to climb before they can say they do astrophotography. And that's just not true. My premise today is take the equipment that you have, no matter what it is, and just start taking pictures. You'll learn from those pictures and you will do better later on. I'll show you some of the early pictures I took. It was actually kind of a fun exercise going through all my old pictures, which were mostly film, and finding the ones that I thought I was, were, were good, and realizing now maybe they weren't as good as I thought they were at the time. But if I could look at those then and understand what was wrong, that would move me along in the astrophotography journal, journey. So what I'm going to try to do is to walk you through some of the simple stuff that you need to do to get started in astrophotography and hopefully give you a few hints on what not to do. I'll show you some of the mistakes that I made. But I also want to give you an opportunity to take a look at your images, analyze them, and say, what do I need to do to do better? Because we can all do, th do these things better. You don't need um, you know, a great big $5,000 astrograph just to get pictures, to take pictures of the sky. This picture that you see here on the right <coughs> excuse me, was an annular eclipse off the Los Angeles coast. It was in January 2000, I'm sorry, January, well, I got the date later on. I think it's January 1990, if I'm not mistaken. And I was just, I just had my Canon SLR with a, a film SLR with a 70 to 210 lens. I was manually snapping the pictures. Eclipses are plenty bright, so I didn't have to worry about tripods or anything. And it's really kind of a, it was a surprise to me as I looked at this. This is probably one of the first astrophotographs I ever took, and it's probably one of the best I ever took. So you don't have to have tons of experience. You just have to be lucky and, and get out there and take the pictures. How many of you guys have cameras that you want to use or, or, and have used them before? Most of you have a camera. How many, of, how many of them are not digital? How many of them are film? So you guys are all digital camera addicts like me. Um, this, what I'm talking about, will work for film. It's not quite as easy because you don't get the immediate feedback for how it came out and you can make adjustments. So you have a, a little bit of a larger challenge with film. But all the things I talked about, uh, I talk about in here are related to film. And quite frankly, many of the pictures that you see will, were taken with film. So we'll see what happens. Um, but it's good to know that you guys are getting that. First of all, if you want great astronomy images, go to the internet and download them. They're, they're, they're out there all over the place. <laughs> Don't bother with all this stuff if you just want pretty pictures. I mean, there's better pictures out there than any of us can take, and they're professionally developed, professionally uh, processed, and the data is free. You can, get, you can download Hubble images and do whatever you want to with them for free, basically. I think you have to have an attribution thing, but they're not copyrighted typically. So if you just want good, good pictures, go to the internet and get them, and you'll save yourself some time and money. However, if you want the pride of having taken that yourself and be able to show your friends what you're seeing in the scopes visually. I think that's one of the reasons I got into astrophotography in the beginning. So I wanted to share with people what I was seeing. In fact, I wanted to share with people things that were better than I was seeing in some cases. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this. But this, the key is to start with the equipment you have. You don't need to solve problems by buying, a, buying new equipment, typically. That helps sometimes, but you don't have to do that. There's a lot you can do before you have to do that. When you take your images, analyze them, make, see what you need to do to make them better, what's wrong with it, what, that, what don't you like about this image, what could you do better, and then apply that to your next session. Um, be careful when you say you want to get into astrophotography. It will put a, a tremendous pressure on your self-restraint. Oh, I got to go have that filter, or I got to go have that auto guider, I got. Yeah, it helps to do that, but figure out what you can do before you make that investment. And sometimes it's necessary, but sometimes it's not. This is what I currently shoot with now. This was not bought overnight. These were purchased incrementally. In fact, the Apo, the, the Tech 160, was traded for, uh, from a 140. So I had a 140 before that, and I had something before that. So this is an evolution of gear that I typically shoot with now. This picture on the right was what I have set up on the field. It's a it's an Epsilon, Takahashi Epsilon 180. It's an astrograph. It's 180 millimeters, f2.8. 
it sucks up the sky. I mean, I can't use it at, at Crockett because there's just too much light pollution. I get about 30 second or a minute subs before the, the sky glow just overwhelms it. So that's what I, that's what I'm, I brought that out here and that's what I use. I'll talk more about some of the other stuff there. But I also have some other gear that I like. Uh, up in the right hand, up in the left hand corner is a, a, an Epsilon 200, which I bought first used. Well, I bought the other one used too, but I bought first used because it came up on Astromont first to decide whether I like it. Now I like the 180, so I'm probably going to get rid of that one eventually. Uh, I've got binoculars. Uh, on the upper left is a, an Acromat 158 telescope, astron or, uh, telescope astro astronomy telescopes 158. I've got a 12 and a half inch Dob, a C11. And over there in the lower right is a uh, Quest Star. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a gadget freak, <laughs> as you can see. But I've got a telescope on order. It's it's <laughs> it's it's due to be it's due to be delivered in 2017. Um, unfortunately, you guys are paying for that too. So <laughs> All right, getting started. We're going to talk about these kinds of things. What kinds of things are there out there to look at? What, what are your targets? What do you want to shoot? Because each target has its own characteristics. And some things you can do easily, and some things it takes a little more talent, skill, expertise, technology, whatever. For each of those subjects, I'm going to talk a little bit about what you need to do to take those kinds of pictures. We're going to talk about the how-to, and then we're going to show you some images um, of things that went wrong. And we're going to have you tell me, or you guys can discuss among yourselves for a short while, what was wrong with that image, and what do we need to do to make it better? Um, and occasionally along the way, I'll, pl I'll provide a little, few lessons learned that, that kind of have helped me avoid some problems later on. These are just my experiences, and I, I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've tried to recover from them. I've solved a lot of problems, but I haven't solved them all. Okay, you guys will experience other ones. There are other people who have other solutions to these problems. These are just the ones that I found worked for me. Um, the, the Yahoo groups are a tremendous source of information for, for finding out how to solve problems in, in various pieces of equipment. Uh, the Novak Listserv is also a tremendous um, resource. If, I don't know whether you're on the Listserv. If you're not on the Listserv and you're interested in stuff like this, get on the Listserv. You ask a question and you'll usually get 10 different opinions from 10 different people. Sometimes 12 different opinions from 10 different people. Um, but when you solve it, when you figure out how to do it, share that solution with everybody, either via discussion with people or on the listserv or something. Because the greatest part about Novak isn't just AHSP or the meetings. It's the wealth of knowledge that we have that we share with one another. And, and you're part of that. Make sure that happens. OK. These are the kinds of things that you can take pictures of in big, broad terms. Uh, star trails. You can set a, picture, a picture, set a camera on a tripod like that, open up the shutter and just let the stars trail. And they're beautiful pictures, especially if you can put something in the foreground before it. You may have to light that, but you know, it, it's, they're just beautiful. We're able to get those with our warning or not. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you want them or not, that's true. <laughs> and you don't need a lot of expensive equipment. What you see right over there is perfectly capable of taking star trail pictures. Just set it up on a tripod. You've got to have something to keep the, lens, uh, keep the shutter open for a while, but it's, it's fine. Bright solar system objects. We're talking like the moon and some of the, well, not some of the planets, but they're not quite as, they're harder because they, they're, they're so small. Um, there's the moon, there's the sun, of course, and, and things like that. Wild field asterisms. There's many, many things out there that just are very familiar. Everybody loves to see a beautiful picture of Orion or a picture of the coat hanger. Those are really cool shots to share with people. And we'll show you some of the things necessary to take those pictures. And then, of course, you have the, what I consider the ultimate anyway, the deep sky objects. Kevin, you're a, you're a master at planetary, and I've never, uh, uh, it's magic how you do what you do. And, and I'll explain what I mean by magic in a, in a little while. But I've never been able to take good planetary, astroph astro pic or planetary pictures, even though I think the equipment I have should be able to do that. It's just not, I have not tried, and it's, it's just not what I'm good at. You guys all take pictures. You know how cameras work. There's, there's an iris for, for aperture and, and uh, uh, a, so occasionally a zoom for focal length. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how astrophotography differs from terrestrial photography. I'm not sure where I'm going with this, so bear with me, but I think it matters, and you'll see why in a little bit. Let's assume that we're taking a picture of Joe over here. 
you know Joe Bag of Donuts, he's in the club. Um, you're taking a picture of Joe over here and you have a, a lens, it's a 50 millimeter lens, relatively modest lens, and it's got a 25 millimeter aperture. Okay, relatively fast um, a 50 millimeter lens, not too bad. But we know because of the way things calculated, the F ratio on that is F2. Okay. So you divide the, the, the focal length by the aperture and you get a focal ratio of F2. And let's say for purposes of argument that setup, if we image for x fractions of a second or a, fa a fixed fraction in time, we let's, let's assume that that gives us a well-exposed picture. And here's our image of Joe um, that we get when we finish that picture. And we're going to assume that the lighting conditions and all the other fault or all that goes around with this makes that the perfect exposure that you want to capture of Joe. Okay, but now let's make a change. Let's put in a longer, let's pin a, put in a longer focal length. The, the aperture remains the same, but the focal length is longer. We now have a, a medium telephoto lens. Well, what happens when you change the focal length is you change the image scale, or another word for that is magnification, of the image that you're taking. Since we had a 50 millimeter here, and we doubled the focal length, I have now increased the size of that picture, the size of that object, by, 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 uh, by, by two times. I've increased the size of it by two. But when I increase the size of it by two, I'm increasing the area that I'm capturing by four, the square of the, of the, of the linear dimension. So even though I'm, I'm um, using the same aperture, by increasing, by doubling the focal length, I am dimming that object because I'm taking the light that I captured and I'm spreading it out. I'm dimming that object by four times, so I'm only getting 25% of the light that I got up here because I've spread it out. So that means if I'm going to match this exposure, and we said this was the baseline, if we're going to match that exposure, I have to expose that for four seconds now. I have to have a longer exposure. Okay? Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, good. Let's make another change to this camera. I am now going to increase the aperture from 25 millimeters to 50 millimeters. Now I've got a much larger scope. It's a longer focal length. Do the math. We got 100 divided by 50. We're now back to f2, the same focal ratio that I had here. But because I have doubled the area, the aperture, I have quadrupled the amount of light that it captures. So I'm now taking this image, I'm doubling it in size, well, yeah, I'm, I'm quadrupling it in size, dimming it, but I'm also quadrupling the area, or the amount of light that I've gathered, so I'm now back to 100% of the light that I got up here, and now I come back to a one second image. Assuming this was the proper exposure, I'm now back to a, a 1x second image, a, a, the same, same thing. So what we can see, I hope, is, is that when you, when you deal with Whoops, back up. When you deal with objects that you're taking pictures of, what, what drives things isn't always the aperture. Sometimes it's the focal length, but sometimes it's the aperture. Really what happens, what's driving things is the focal ratio. Here we got an F2, it takes X seconds. F2, it takes X seconds. But if we have an F4, it takes four times that to get a proper exposure. So what's the driving factor here is the F ratio not the aperture. We often think aperture rules in telescopes, but when you're taking a, a photograph of an extended object, like a face or, or something, the, uh, the focal ratio is kind of what rules the exposure and how, how, how well your picture is exposed. And that works for Joe Bag of Donuts as well as it does for that spiral nebula that you see <laughs> over there. Um, it, the, same, the same principles apply. So for astrophotography, the extended objects depend more on the F ratio they use than it does either the aperture or the focal, focal length. Obviously, they're related, and that relationship is called the F ratio. So now, let's take it from that galaxy or that spiral nebula that we were imaging, and now let's image a globular, I mean, a, an open cluster. In fact, we're just going to image a single star in that open cluster. And again, like we had before, you've got the, the baseline that we have set up. 25 millimeter aperture, 50 millimeter lens, it's an F2, and our image comes out at a certain brightness, and we think that's the right brightness for us. Okay? That's the baseline. If I move forward and extend, put that other telescope that I had on there, which is 100 millimeters, stars are points of light. When you increase the magnification, unless you've got a really huge scope, they're still points of light. 
So you're not spreading that light over anything when you're taking a picture of stars, whether they be double stars or their clusters or whatever. You're not spreading it, so you're still getting the same amount of light on the, on the uh, striking the film or striking the sensor. And so this, the proper image, the proper exposure, even though it's 100 millimeters, is now the same, the original X number of seconds that you used for the, for the original scope. So let's use our other scope. Now we've doubled the size of the aperture. We've, because of the square of the size, we've, we've, you've spread that light over, you've, you've spread the light over the same area, but now you're collecting four times the amount of light that you did before. So what's the proper exposure for stars? A quarter of a second. So if you go back to, if you go back to the other one, we had, uh, we had one, we had one X number of seconds and X number of seconds based on the F ratio. Now, what matters and what's driving this is the aperture. So aperture rules when it comes to point objects, but F ratio rules when you're taking photographs of extended objects because you're spreading that light over them. That's, um, it's, a, it's a major difference between terrestrial photography and astrophotography, especially when you're taking pictures of stars or points of light. Now, technically, it's not true. It depends on aperture, but when, we all know that when a star gets, when you take longer and longer exposure of the star, the star actually bloats and gets bigger because you're spreading that light over more pixels. So in practice, it doesn't always work exactly that way. So you don't always need to take a quarter of the light, that you, a quarter of the exposure that you're taking. You'll use other means for determining the right exposure. But it's, it's different. It's fundamentally different than when you're taking a, a picture of, a, of a, an extended object. Um, the name's escaping. There's a book called The FX System, and I have his name later on in the, in the briefing, that describes this exquisitely. It really lays that out, and it shows you how to use that in terms of estimating the exposures for, um, for different types of objects. It gives you index numbers, and it's a good book. I would recommend it, and I'll tell you the name of it, and I'll tell you the author here in a few minutes. Sorry. Is No, it's not. That's his own system? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a, a different book. It's also a good book, but it's different. All right, long duration star trails. Again, very pretty, especially give you, if you give them toward, you get it towards the north and you can get uh, Polaris and that in there. Records the motion of the stars, but while you're doing that, it's also possible that you'll pick up some meteors or a satellite trail or an iridium satellite flare, all kinds of things that you can capture that are interesting targets while you're taking these pictures. If you know where the iridium flare is going to be, um, uh, uh, heavens-above.com is a place to go for that. There are others, but that's place, one place to go. You can set up your camera, take a long exposure star trail, and have the iridium flare go right through the picture, and it's kind of neat. <coughs> if you see aurora, um, that's another good way to capture aurora without any fancy equipment. Again, just the basic uh, camera set up on a tripod. And that's what I'm going to talk about. What do you need? It's pretty basic. You need a steady tripod, and by steady um, it depends on your conditions. If it can, if it's shaky and moves around a lot and you can get it to slump and stay in one position, that's steady enough, okay? <laughs> you just don't want it moving from the wind or shaking of the floor, um, but if it's a moderately steady tripod. It doesn't have to be a, a really expensive one. Good, a good camera with a good external power supply. When we're out taking pictures, Oftentimes, you're leaving the shutter open for minutes at a time, sometimes hours at a time, but usually minutes at a time. Most all digital cameras that I'm aware of have an electronic shutter, and it, it, it uses battery to, to keep that shutter open, as well as to process the electronics. And you can very quickly deplete a battery, especially if it's cold. So you either have to have a spare set of batteries, so you can replace it out, or you have to have, I guess I'm probably talking about this a little too early, but I'll show you anyway. There are things that you can use to plug into your, your, um, your, uh, your power source for your telescope or whatever, 12 volt battery, and you can plug, you plug this, end into, this end into your camera, replaces the battery, and you plug the other end, which is back in my box, but you plug the other end into your, into your power source, and you can, you can keep your camera operating all night long without having to worry about it dying. Um, the other advantage of this is as it gets towards the lower end of the battery, you're changing voltages in there. And I don't know about you, but I'm sure you heard this before. People take dark image, uh, dark shots um, to, to, to erase some of the noise. 
when you take your darks at the end and your battery's kind of low, I'm not confident that I'm getting exactly the same noise signature that I have when I have a full battery. You use something like this. It, um, I bought these, I bought mine from Hutech. Um, Hutech. No, it's not even Hutech.com. It's actually a, a Borg, a guy that sells Borg in this country. Um, I don't know. Find me after and I'll, I'll show you. But you can, you can, um, yeah. They're moderately expensive, I have to admit. Luck. That's good luck with that too. Um, but I find it invaluable when I'm taking pictures just to have that constant power supply. I don't have to worry about the electronics fading out. All right, how do you how do we do this? Did we get everything here? No, we didn't. Oh, yeah. No, you, you didn't put I did, didn't I? Okay, good power supply. The lens of your choice. And of course, the lens of your choice is going to depend upon what picture you're taking. If you're taking a big picture of Orion, that's one lens you want to use if you want to get. Uh, just the just the um, the uh, the sword of Orion. That's a d different lens. So whatever field of view you want, you choose your lens. And you also probably need to have a cable release. Used to be these were cables that's in film cameras. These are cables that screwed into the shutter, into the shutter release button. But now they have these things. They're called intervalometers, and they're marvelous. I basically don't use a computer when I image anymore. I just set up my imaging run on this thing, and it tell, it tell, it, you tell it how, long, how many images you want to take, how long you want the image to be, how long you want to wait between images. Just put all that in there in about 10 seconds, push the button, and go. But the real advantage of this is when you, when you push this button, the, the, the shutter release button, you're not shaking the camera. Okay? So it, the camera remains steady, so you don't get any major star trails. Those are, are brand specific in terms of the they are not only brand specific, but camera specific. It's this connector right here. This particular one came from Korea. It was a knockoff that somebody in Korea made. But what matters, and the reason you need a specific one for your camera, is this connector sometimes changes even between the same brands. Now, I was fortunate that the 40D that I have and the 5D Mark II that I have all had the same one. But some of the TI um, models have, have different connectors. And so you just got to buy the one that you need. But it's, I don't want to say any of this is essential, but it's really important. A way to get around that if you want, you take a dark card, put it in front of the lens, hit the button so that it starts the timer, and then you take the, the card away and you don't get the, the shakiness from the camera because you shut the button. So it's not, it's not essential, but it sure helps. All right, how to. Put the camera on the tripod, point to an interesting section of the sky, this is the advantage of, of digital. You can take several test shots to see whether or not you're properly framed. Is it oriented so that it's pleasing in the camera? Do I have a long enough exposure so that I can capture enough light to make the photograph come out? That's the advantage of digital. You couldn't do that with film. Back when I was using film, I took my picture, and two weeks later I found out whether it came out because Walmart was too far away to go to process my pictures or whatever. So it, it, digital is wonderful when it comes to that. As far as, as far as tar trails go, they can be a little tricky. Um, you want to leave the image, you want to leave the shutter open for as long as you can. Let me just show you this for a second. I'll come back to that other chart. If I leave the exposure, we all know that the sky turns about 15 degrees an hour at the equator. 15 degrees an hour. So if I take a three minute shot, that's only 45 arc seconds. I'm sorry, yeah, three minute exposure, 75 arc, uh, 0.75 degrees. Um, so it's only 45 arc seconds, if that's right. Uh, and so it doesn't give you much of a trail if I'm only shooting three minutes. But if the sky is bright, the stars are bright, I may not, that might be the proper exposure for that image. There's a way around it, I'll tell you. If you take it for 10 minutes, it comes out to be two and a half seconds of arc. To get a full 30 degrees, uh, or, is that right? Yeah, 30 degrees, you got to image for, or I guess it's 40 degrees, you got to image for 20 minutes, 60 minutes. Okay, but 60 minutes in anybody's sky is going to overwhelm your picture. You're going to have too much sky glow. You're going to have over, overblown, overblown stars or whatever. But the answer is you basically just stop down your lens. If you're using a camera lens, just stop it down. Instead of using f2.8 or whatever your maximum is, stop it down to f10 or f12 or even lower. And that will reduce the amount of light that you're getting and allow you to get longer star trails. Or you can change the ISO. Instead of using 1600, go down to 400 or something like that. You can get longer star trails because <coughs> you can get longer exposures. I'm going to go back to this one and see if there's anything I missed. 
Uh, overwhelmed by sky glow, reduce the aperture. How much arc can you get? All right, we already talked about all that stuff. This is a, th this is a 10 minute exposure of the Big Dipper and Polaris up at the top. There's the Big Dipper and there's Polaris. A 10 minute exposure on film. Okay, so you can get some interesting effects. Uh, it's nice when you can get a recognizable constellation in there, like the Big Dipper. Um, but when I did it digitally, uh, without adjusting my ISO and everything else, I only was able to get a minute and a half before the sky glow started overwhelming the picture. And this is before I realized I could make those, some of those other adjustments. So when I got back home, I stacked eight minute and a half images on top of one another, and I was able to get the sky glow. And you can even, what I like about this shot, you can even begin to detect some of the color mm -hmm. in the various stars. Okay. And that's because, partly because the star is trailing and it never saturates any given image. If you take a picture too long with a star in the same place, that pixel will saturate. You get no color data because you've lost all the dynamic range in that picture. But if you, if you um, reduce that exposure, you can, you can pick up the color. Have you, have you experimented with reducing the ISO instead of reducing the aperture? Either one works. I have not experimented. In fact, the ISO is probably better because you're reducing the noise in the image when you reduce the ISO. So. Did you put colors on the other one? Uh, the, the three minute I did, the film one, a little bit, not much, okay. Pardon me? Pretty hard to stack films. It is, very challenging. People can do it. People have done it, but that, someone want to try. These are pictures I took out in New Mexico. Um, the top one is a three minute star trail of the zodiacal light. Anybody not know what the zodiacal light is? Dust orbiting the, orbiting the sun. And I like that picture. I took a 10 minute picture also, again, no, this was digital, that's right. Took a 10 minute picture, and while the star trails are longer, the zodiacal light seems to overwhelm the, is too bright to, to notice it, to see it. So I prefer this one. So in this particular case, even though the star trails are shorter, I like that one better. Again, you got digital, you can see what you get, you can see what you like, you just play with it. The important point is, take the picture. All right, what can go wrong? You're taking star trails, very simple. You just put it up on the tripod, hit your intervalometer, and sit back and watch the pictures be taken. Well, focus is very important. We'll talk about how to get a good focus a little bit later on in the talk. Um, I can't tell you the number. I, I went to shoot landed meteors for back in the 80, 80, 1998, 99, 2000, 2001. There was a tremendous increase in landed meteor activity. I went out and shot those, and almost every single star trail picture I have I would walk by and kick the tripod. <laughs> I don't know why, but I had this lovely star trail, like, you know, going across like that. Be careful when you have it set up. Don't go near the tripod until you're ready to turn it all off. Okay. Got to make sure you have the correct exposure and all those ISO stuff that, that we talked about, um, and make sure you have the camera powered adequately. And of course, there's dew. Um, you guys hear often enough, I've got some examples of dew. dew uh, do, do fighters here. I'll just pass them around and show them to you. You guys, this is the old Kendrick mm -hmm. and then the do heater that wraps around the camera. But what worked best for me, when I'm, especially when I'm shooting a camera lens, are the old hand warmers. Mm -hmm. You open these up, get them activated a little bit, you pass those around. And then, but the question is, how do you keep them on? Um, I looked a little funny when I went into the drugstore and bought these hair, hair, uh, hair things, but I guess I'm man enough to put up with it. You just attach one on each side and you, and you wrap that around and, and it works fine. Keeps the dew off your camera, off your lens all night long. Dew heaters work too, but then you gotta have battery and everything else. But those things are very simple and cheap. The other one I found are these foot warmers and they're long, so you can, you can pretty much stick them all the way around and then you only have to use one thing. Okay. Dew is a, a continual problem. For first night I went out to take linear meteor shot, Leonid meteor pictures, I had my lens and within 30 minutes the lens had fogged up and I thought I was done. I thought I'm planning on doing this all night, I can't do anything. So I had one of the pocket heaters but I had nothing to put it on with so I found an old sock and I wrapped the old sock around it and tied it. Creative, creative solutions. All right. Yes. Along those lines, another way to keep dew off your camera if you're worried about the effects of the electronics, take a kitchen size garbage bag, cut one corner off so that it's about the same diameter as the front of your lens, 
and just put it up over the carriage as a rubber band. And it, and it keeps the coverage. It also keeps it warmer, too, you got to be careful. So you're going to increase your noise a little bit, but better that than shorting out your electronics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, story I love to tell. When you're out observing, and I don't care whether you're taking pictures or you're looking through your scope or whatever, always carry two flashlights. I've told you before about my Leonid meteor experiences. The, I think it was 98. Leonids were raining bolides all over the sky. It was a, there, there weren't these little ash meteors that come in. These were pebbles. They were creating huge streaks with trails. And they were just amazing. And I was trying to keep track of how many, or when I saw them, so I could calculate a rate. So I have a little notebook, and I saw one now, and I'd write down the time, and I'd write down the time. But throughout the night, November gets cold, the batteries on my flashlight die. Oh, dear. So I unscrew the back of the flashlight, take out the old batteries. It's pitch black. I don't know where my new batteries are. I, I wasn't organized enough at the time to figure out where I was. So I spent 20 minutes looking for, handing, feeling around, looking for my batteries. Finally found my batteries. I popped two batteries in my flashlight. And now I don't remember where I put the back of the flashlight. <laughs> so I spent 20 minutes looking for the back of the flashlight. Meanwhile, I'm doing this looking on the ground. The meteors are going off like flash bulbs on the ground before me. I was just losing. I lost about 40, 45 minutes of observing beautiful meteors that night. Finally, I said, the heck with it. I don't need, a, I don't need a, a, a time for each meteor. I just sat down and I watched the rest of the meteor storm. Light started to get light. I crawled into my car, put back the seat, went to sleep for a while. When I woke up, around my neck was a lanyard, and at the end of the lanyard was the battery, the back of the, back of the, <laughs> back of the, bat the uh, flashlight. So, Word to the wise, always carry two flashlights. They don't have to be red, although your neighbors might appreciate it, but carry one that you use and then stick another one in your back pocket because it's going to happen to you. Uh, we talked about decreasing the ISO to, for, to reduce sky glow and take longer exposures. Uh, there's another interesting trick you can do when you're taking meteors, I'm sorry, not meteor star trails. You start the image and you let it cook for a couple of seconds and then you put a hat over it. Meanwhile, you're not tracking, you just, you got to just have it on a tripod. You put a hat or a card or something in front of it, and then you take it away and let the rest of the star trail. What happens is you develop a little dot at the beginning of the trail of each star, and then the rest of the trail goes along. And it makes for a very interesting effect because it makes it easier to pick out the constellations because of this dot that, that starts. So that's another, another fun one. If you have foreground in your picture of the stars trailing, Take your red flashlight or a white flashlight if you don't have people that are going to object and just kind of scan it across the area of the foreground in front of you so that you have something in front of the picture and something behind it. It gives it some depth and gives it some a pretty composition. Okay, Just some of the things you can do with star trails. And they're not hard to do, um, but there are some techniques that keep it from being a problem. Okay, Sprite solar system objects. That's the next category of things we're going to talk about. What am I talking about? We're talking about the sun. Uh, you need a filter. You need an adequate filter. You need a filter that goes on the front of the telescope, not screws into the eyepiece. I was literally observing in uh, Victorville, California, high desert, in the, around, in, the, in the cold weather. The filter was cold. We slewed it to the sun. My friend was looking through the telescope, and the filter cracked. It does happen. Fortunately, he pulled away quickly enough, didn't damage his eye, but it could have, it just was a hairline crack as opposed to shattering. Could have really hurt him. Those, those rumors are true. That does happen. Don't ever use a filter that screws onto the eyepiece, a glass filter. Always use one that covers the front and make sure it's of adequate density. Some of these are for photography, and they let more light through than is, is meant for visual. So make sure it's the right filter. And make sure it won't come off. It's got to be steady on there, and it's not going to blow away. Exactly. Uh, lunars, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses are perfect targets. Uh, the moon is usually bright enough to be able to capture without a, without a tripod. I was, done, I was out and even during all but the most central part of the eclipse. I was getting seven seconds, eight second exposures um, without too much trailing. Uh, uh, the moon, the moon with all of its phase changes, you can you can capture different pictures of that. Asteroids and comets as they as they appear in the sky, wonderful targets, meteor showers and aurora. Um, <clears throat> okay. Again, simple stuff. You need a camera, a steady tripod, maybe steadier than that 
Velbron that you got from Walmart, you know, but a steady tripod, the lens of choice based on what you're taking a picture of, uh, the cable release, and of course the sun filter. Not sun filter, not much more than you need for, for star trails. The reason you don't need much more is because most of these objects that we talked about back here, they're all relatively bright. So you can take relatively short exposures. As long as your exposures are relatively short, it's not going to move very much. So you, can, you have not much more equipment necessary to capture some of those bright solar system objects. What can go wrong? Oh, well, this is a different, I'm sorry, not getting ahead of myself. 35 millimeter chip is based on the 35 millimeter frame. But most digital SLRs these days have what's called an APS-C size chip. And it's about 60% of the size of a regular 35 millimeter frame of film or a 35 millimeter thing. So these numbers that you see over here, and we'll talk about what they mean, are relative to a 35 millimeter chip. To get to find out what size, or to find out the field of view rather of the of the focal length of that picture, you need to divide these numbers by 60 percent. Now let me go to the back to the table and I'll tell you show you what I mean. What's the field of view? How much sky can you get with the focal length camera that you're using? Right. If I have a 400, a 400 millimeter telescope, let's say 500. If I have 500 millimeters telescope, I can get four degrees by almost three degrees. That's the 2.8 epsilon that I have. So I have 500 millimeter focal length. I get 400, 400. I'm sorry. I get four degrees uh, on a side of the sky, and it's just a. I, I've fallen in love with wide field images. So that's one of the things. As you go forward, you're down here in the um, S SCT range. I guess that's the SCT range. You're going to get about a degree by three quarters of a degree. So your sun, the moon or the sun will fit nicely in that field of view, along with several constellations, not constellations, several asterisms and things like that. But that's the, the field of view. You start getting up here, you're putting barlows on things, you're cutting things down to about six degrees, by, or six arc minutes by four, minute, four arc minutes. Again, you're spreading the light out when you get up to that much magnification. So you, your images are going to have to be longer and you're going to have to guide and do some other things. So most of, the, most of these things are here. Um, again, let's take the example, 1,000 millimeters. 1,000 millimeters is here. Um, I've got to divide, I've got to multiply that by 0.6, which gives me 1.26. I've got to multiply that by, one, by, by 0.6, gives me 8.4. So for 1,000 millimeter telescope uh, on an APS-C size chip, I'm going to get a one and a quarter by Eight, eight, by almost a degree um, in field of view. All right, this is going back to, I don't remember the date, 1990, I think it was, January of 1990, Los Angeles, annular eclipse. I was living in San Bernardino, San Bernardino at the time. We drove out to the beach, and the pictures were amazing because down, it was down in the sun. It didn't need a solar filter. The, 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 the clouds were filtering it out. I don't know whether you can see it, but down here there are some surfers paddling around. Beautiful, beautiful opportunity. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, wait, there's a guy. He's getting up on a wave. I'm going to get a picture of this guy surfing across in front of the annual eclipse. This is National Geographic. This is sky and telescope stuff. I'm going to be famous. He wiped out just as I was taking the picture. <laughs> So lots of things can go wrong. <clears throat> what, else, what else can go, go wrong here? Let's see, this first picture didn't show up. There it goes. What's wrong with that picture? Again, solar system object, we're taking pictures relatively bright. What's, what's wrong with that picture? You can't see the rest of the moon. I can't see the rest of the moon. What, what am I taking a picture of here? A lunar eclipse. Well, this is probably too bright, but it's probably OK. But the rest of the moon is too dark. Okay, so it's an underexposed image unless what I was trying to capture was this crescent shape of the brightness. So what this needed to benefit from is longer exposure or bigger aperture or whatever, the, whatever control. I needed more light. Okay. Um, again, this is properly exposed. This one's overexposed. Let me back up a little bit. This can happen very easily because the brightness of the moon changes dramatically as it gets deeper and deeper into the shadow of the Earth. And so you can be taking you know, an eighth of a second picture and very quickly, it now requires a, a second or three seconds. I think, I think the longest one I've, I've had to take was an eight second image of the lunar eclipse in order to get it to be properly exposed when it was deep into the umbra. 
So this can happen very easily. This is a little bit less likely because you're, you're, you're going to know that it's overexposed when you see the picture and you just change the aperture or the time. What's wrong with that picture? First of all, what is it? Mars. Mars. What's wrong with the picture? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's the best, 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 <laughs> astro, best, loop, best planetary picture I've ever taken, Kevin. I know, I know you're probably laughing at me at this point, but that's the best astrophotograph I've ever taken of, of planets. I was the, the, the channels weren't aligned, but it's a color camera, right? It's a color camera. Yeah, so it's yep. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting some sort of blue atmospheric effect. I thought maybe the atmosphere was bulging or something. I don't know what's wrong with that picture, but that's why I don't take planetary pictures, because that's the best one I've ever done. But there are things that you can do. Kevin, what would you do to make that picture better? Um, I would uh, separate the three channels and see if you could align them better. Okay. Because you could, you could pull out the red and the blue and you know nudge blue down, nudge red up. Sure. Uh, sort of design. fixing the chromatic aberration. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you can, but you can't, you can't get past it, because at least unless you're shooting directly overhead, Blue is going to be smeared out more than red. From the atmosphere. You cannot recover from yeah. that. Yeah. So anyway, I'm proud of that picture because that's the best planet I ever took. What's wrong with this picture? First of all, what's it a picture of? Transit of Venus. Venus. 2004, Venus went across the surface of the sun. I was there to get pictures of it. Me and everybody else alive was the first time we had seen it. Anybody alive had seen it. Anyway, however that story goes. What's wrong with the picture? Lightly. Lightly. This was a film camera. It was an older camera. I'd used it many times for astrophotographs, never had a problem with it. But I was using it in daylight here, and all the, all the insulation around the, around the corner, the foam that's supposed to isolate the light, that had degraded, and I never noticed it until I started taking these pictures. It's a cool picture, though. Good. Yeah, I'm proud of that. Except for the bad parts. But again, that's my point. If that was the only picture I ever took of the transit of Venus, I'd have a record of it. I'd be proud of that picture. I did take other ones, but I'd be proud of that picture. And that's my point. Keep taking the pictures. If they don't come out perfect, at least you've learned something. I learned my camera had light leaks. And I've also learned that, I mean, I, I also know, I also have a picture that I can be proud of. Okay. No and surfer. It, I'm no surfer, surfer. though. <laughs> there wasn't much I could do about that. About that one. All right. So I could use the wrong type of solar filter and I could have it crack and blind my friend, or I could use the wrong type of solar filter and, and have the picture over underexposed. Especially during the day, when you begin taking shots of the sun, for example, focus frequently, because when you focus initially, that's fine, but as the sun hits it, it's gonna heat up. So you need to focus frequently. Uh, eclipsing moon getting too dim for the unguided shots, we saw an example of that. And, and, and the other one I, I really, I did, I've never done this, but I've heard of people who have. When you're doing solar imaging and you got that really nice, expensive Bader solar filter on the front and you're down there looking, you're wondering what that pain in your shoulder is, it's the, it's the focuser focusing the sunlight on your shoulder, burning a little hole in your, in your clothes. So cover the, don't forget to cover the focuser when you're, when you're observing. Finder. Finder, thank you. Sometimes it works. Again, this was a film shot of Hale Bop. It's one of the first times I actually intentionally went out to take a picture of something at night. I built a barn door mount just to take these pictures. And there's the Pleiades, and there's Hale Bop. The picture didn't come out well when I scanned it, but it was, I was very, very proud of the picture when, when I took it. Again, keep taking those pictures. Uh, Leonid meteor showers, just a couple, of, a couple of them. I had one picture that had nine meteors in it. Uh, one 10-minute picture. Um, these are two iridium flares that happen to be going off about 30 seconds between one another. Uh, Heavensabove.com will tell you when they're going to be, and you can often see that there's two of them going to follow one right after or there. I suspect one's not active and the other's a spare, and they're in the same orbit, and that's why you see them like that. So the last picture you were tracking? Stars yes, I had, my, I had my camera set on the back of my C8, C8 Deluxe and a fork mount. And it was tracking, it, it was tracking, not guiding, but just tracking the sky. I left it open for 10 minutes and the meteors just happened to appear. Okay. And that's my second favorite astrophotograph of the solar system. Uh, many images of, nine images of the moon taken independently and then with Photoshop I positioned each one in the approximate position where it was when the picture was taken. So what you're seeing is the moon moving through the round shadow of the Earth. 
So if you have any friends that are flatlanders and believe that the earth is flat, you can show them this picture and they'll have to believe that it's round. The reason I say that's my second favorite astro photograph of the solar system object is because that's my first favorite picture of the solar system object. It's, it's the science project my, my daughter did when she was in school. Well, I like it anyway. All right. Bright solar system objects. Be careful when you're looking near the sun. You can damage yourself or your equipment. Use a solar filter. Take several test shots. Again, digitally you can take test shots and, and, and hone in on the right image. You notice many of these things are the same lessons that you learned before. We'll talk about that in a minute. Use short exposures to avoid, avoid smearing. We did, what, a half a second last night on some of the stars? And we got them down to, with his, with his scope, we got them down to a really small a fraction of a, of a, it was just smearing slightly. So when you zoomed out, it looked like it was a pretty good, you were taking double cluster, I think that was. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, foreground, again, if you're taking pictures of stuff in the sky, foreground objects give it depth and, cons and beauty. And like anything else, you want to focus carefully, but how do you achieve focus? It's hard. My suggestion, first of all, you can image, you know, you can, you can, if you have live view, you can get the image of a star near where you're going to shoot and you can get that star in focus and in fact with most cameras you can zoom in with that live view and get a ten, ten times image view and you can turn your focuser knob and get it pretty close to, fo to perfect. But there's another way to do that. Any of you guys use these before, the Batnov masks? Anybody not use these or want to know we talk about them? Okay. Batnov mask is literally magic. Okay, magic I define, we talked about magic before, magic I define as technology so advanced that you can't understand it, but it still works. <laughs> I have no idea why these things work. You could probably explain it to us, but I don't know why these work. But let me show you how they work. You put these in front of, when you're ready to focus, you put a bright star in, in your field of view. You slip this on the front of the telescope. And this is the field of view that you see. You see two diagonal diffraction lines here and here, or here and here. And then you see a third line that crosses those. That's this line here. Okay. Um, as you turn the focus, that line moves in this direction. And when you get that line exactly in the middle, and this is, those are pictures I got offline. These are pictures that I, a picture that I took. When you get that line in exactly in the middle, by definition, you're in focus. I don't know why that works. You could probably explain it to me, but it's more fun to call it magic. <laughs> because it is. It just works. It's amazingly, amazingly useful and, and, and helpful. All right, so that's the way to do it. So we're now going to talk about wide field asterisms and constellations. Now we're getting to a little bit more challenging area. You're not talking about super bright things, but you're not talking about super tiny things either. So we're talking about asterisms. Anybody recognize that star field? And? Gemini. Very good. All right. We ought to have you plate solve our, our, uh, <laughs> our, our images. Capella. All right, so we're looking, we're looking for things that, that are pretty in the sky to help us show our friends or make pretty pictures on our walls or whatever. I think some of the, these are some of the prettier constellations. And again, with a 50 millimeter lens or something like that, you can take some brick pictures. There's some most wonderful asterisms out there. Some are triangles, a little bit big and a little boring to get a picture of, but you could do it. Um, the coat hanger is a fantastic one. It's a binocular field of view item. You need a pretty good, pretty good lens, maybe a 100 millimeter lens or better to get a picture of that, but it's pretty. ET cluster, that's one of the favorites I like to show at, at star parties. Kids always go, ooh, when they see it. It's fun. And then, of course, Orion's belt is pretty. Those are just some of the things. What do you need? Camera, electronic shutter, shutter release. Any of this sounding familiar? <clears throat> at this point, you're going to need a moderate or wide angle lens for, for constellations. Or you're going to need a sturdy tripod for that and for the rest of it below. But for smaller asterisms like the Bronchi cluster and, and so on, you're going to need a longer lens on the telescope. And I hate to tell you this, you're going to need some way to track the sky. It's really hard at, those, at these magnet, magnifications. The, the constellations are not bad. You can get them. But when you're talking about some of the smaller things, you're going to need some way of having the scope follow the rotation of the Earth. All right. How much time can you get on a regular tripod? A lot of different theories on this. Um, this book, this came from uh, Michael Covington's book, Astrophotography for the Amateurs. 
The problem is it depends on how far away you are from the celestial equator. Things near the celestial equator move more rapidly in angular, angular rate than things that are up near the, the pole. If you're at the pole, theoretically nothing moves. Okay? But as you move down, things begin to move more quickly. So how long, how many seconds you can expose for based on your, uh, on how long you can expose without having the stars blur is based on your latitude. Um, at, at zero degrees, right at the equator, we're talking um, anywhere from 55 seconds. You can get a 55 second shot if you have an 18 millimeter without it blurring too much. Or you can go down to two and a half seconds with a 400 millimeter. Beyond that, you're talking about shots that are probably too short to be effective. This is the guy's name I was telling you about before that I couldn't remember. Barry Gordon, guy wrote, the guy wrote a book called FX System. But he has a rule of thumb that you don't need to memorize the table. For stars near the equator, if you take the focal length of your scope and divide it into 700, that's approximately how long you can go without having the stars trail more than a half a, a, half a millimeter on the, or I'm sorry, a, a 20th of a millimeter on film. Uh, so for we have a, a 700, we have a 100 millimeter, 100 millimeter lens, use that for me, they can get seven seconds, which isn't too far off from the 10 seconds that he had. It's just the rule of thumb. You probably go up to 1,000 if you want to be stringent, you take it down to 500. But divide your focal length into 700, gives you a rough number of seconds that you can do imaging without, um, without having to track. All right, how do you do that? Again, mount the scope on the tripod or the mount. Set up and align the equatorial mount to the scope. I'm not going to tell you how to do that today because that's a subject far uh, beyond um, the entry level stuff and there's lots of ways to do it. It's sometimes easy, sometimes not. If you're taking big wide field pictures, you don't have to align that accurately. You won't see very much drift. Then you want to aim, frame, and focus your, your target. Shoot several test images, again, trying to get the right exposure. Uh, check for exposure, trailing stars, image position, and so on. And then finally, once you get all that set up on your test images, you want to shoot a series of images that you can later process and turn into something that you can be proud of. Let's go some more images. What's wrong with that? Focus. Big Dipper. Nice Big Dipper shot over here. We got the uh, Polaris over here, but it's way out of focus. Either that or I had a really big telescope and I was magnifying the stars. No, never mind. Um, out of focus. Pardon me? Yes. It's one of the nice parts about, about taking out of focus or in, improperly exposed. You get the color. I'll show you one in a little bit I really like. <clears throat> What's wrong with that? Well, that's actually a meteor. That's one of the, Ryan, that's one of the Leonid meteors I was trying to capture. But that, we, that year, I went out and put my camera on the tripod and took pictures. And it was about 4 o'clock in the morning that I realized, I was used to shooting through my telescope, I realized I hadn't checked the aperture on my camera. So I was shooting it like at f11 <laughs> instead of opening it up at f2.8 or whatever it was capable of. So this one is clearly under, well, maybe not clearly, but it's underexposed. Ah, another beautiful picture. This was taken out in Arizona, or in New Mexico, rather. Orion, what's wrong with the picture? Shrubbery. Shrubbery? That's not shrubbery. That's foreground. <laughs> right. Well, the other, first thing. I had this piggybacked on another telescope, and I have the bulge of the, the, the front of the scope. Eh, you could probably tolerate that. But what's wrong with all these little tiny images here? I, I, I think I must have kicked the, bumped the tripod or something happened. Um, maybe the mirror flopped a little bit. But again, figuring out how to solve those problems required me to figure out what was wrong. Is this the one? No, oh, this is the one. Here's a picture of the a wide field picture of the North American Nebula. Okay, um, what's wrong with the picture? Coma. Coma. First of all, I got some vignetting that I could take care of if I was shooting if I was shooting with flats. That would bring the brightness of the corners up a lot. But the real problem with this picture is vignetting. If I took a magnification of that, look what those stars look like. I'm sorry, I said vignetting. I meant coma. Real problem is coma. The center is nice and clear. All the stars are nice and round. But I got these little seagulls lying out on the outer edge. That's because I had the aperture fully open because I was trying to catch as much light. It's really hard to make lenses perfect when, when you're trying to make them perfect all the way to the end. The, rate of, the way to solve this, instead of having it set at 2.8, for example, stop it down to 3.5. You'll get rid of the errors that were caused by imperfections around the edge of the lens, you get a little bit less light, 
but you won't see problems like that. So if you're seeing problems like that, stop down the lens. What's wrong with that? Lens cap, you know, lens cap battery, who knows? <laughs> okay. Something went wrong, the picture got taken and there was nothing there. All right, what could, what could possibly go wrong? Do, we talked about do, you have the same problems with do. Shifting focus, we saw that before. Again, over the, over the night, your telescope's gonna cool down and it's gonna change length slightly. If you're at a high, a high, uh, a fast camera, that focal range where it's in focus is very critical. Focus several times during the night. <clears throat> uh, incorrect aperture, don't forget to set it to bulb. Airplanes and satellites and UFOs flying through your pictures, that happens to me all the time. No comment about UFOs, okay. Uh, telescope appears in the field of view of the wide shot. Stop down the aperture, we talked about that. And adequate power to the camera, this is where I was supposed to talk about the batteries. Okay, we already talked about the batteries, plug it in. <clears throat> Takes several test shots. We're gonna talk about the histogram for a minute because that's your best friend in terms of figuring out how long your shots are gonna need to take. Um, stop it down, warm the lens. We talked about the dew heaters. Uh, have extra camera batteries. I think we took all of those into account. Oh, this one we didn't. Shoot long after dark. If you're trying to get real faint fuzzies, it's amazing how much darker the sky gets after, after astronomical twilight to midnight. People start turning down off their lights, People start, businesses, businesses start shutting down, the sky glow decreases dramatically until you get to about midnight and then it doesn't get too much, deep, too much darker than that. If you're shooting faint fuzzies, shoot, high, shoot it when it's near the meridian because it's highest in the sky, you'll get less uh, uh, atmospheric disturbance. All right, this is a, a histogram. Histogram shows the, the, um, the brightness of the, I'm gonna write, find the right button, the brightness of the individual pixels. In other words, this is a black pixel. This is how many black pixels there are and this is how many white pixels there are. The histogram shows the number of pixels that are within, that are of that brightness, okay? When you're taking, when you're taking digital photographs, you want, a, and I'm talking mainly extended objects, deep sky objects, uh, not so much stars. It's harder to judge in stars. But when you're taking um, extended objects, you want that darkest pixel to be about 20% away from the left-hand edge of the histogram. And that's because you're gonna be subtracting the noise. And you want to be, you want to have as much dynamic range in this area here so that you don't have to worry about subtracting signal when you subtract the noise, okay? Um, I was afraid you were gonna ask me to do that. Um, the way it was explained to me, and I also haven't, well, I'll, I'll say yes, I believe it, because I'm giving the talk. Um, if, if this histogram is way over here, Okay, and I, and I take my shots, I'm not taking advantage of the full dynamic range or as much of the dy dynamic range of the picture as I can. If I'm shooting a longer shot, that's gonna move this mountain, if you will, over to the right, and it's also gonna move this edge of the mountain over to the right, so I'm getting a longer dynamic, a larger dynamic range. But the way it was explained to me, the reason you do this is because when you subtract the, when you, when you take the darks, and the darks are by definition all dark, except for hot pixels, when you take the darks, there's some electronic noise in that dark frame that you are recording when you take the darks. And that's the electronic noise is what you want to subtract out with the darks. That's thermal noise from the, from the, um, from the electronics in the camera. It's readout noise from getting the signal from the CCDs out into the, into the memory. It's all kinds of noise sources, but they're all pretty dark. If you have that mixed in with your signal here, you can't separate it out. But if you, if you move this far enough away, when you subtract out that noise, when you subtract out that dark, those dark frames, this, it, it removes noise and not signal. So you're keeping your signal to noise ratio as high as possible. Does that sound a little more yeah. feasible? Good. So um, keep taking, take, taking test shots and increasing the length until you get about the, the, the left side, the dark side, join the dark side over to there. All right, some objects are easy to shoot, some are not. Anybody recognize? The Pleiades and the Hyades, okay. Um, bright examples of deep sky objects, and I'm using bright examples because that's what you should be shooting as you get more experienced into, into in astrophotography. Don't try for those really, really, really faint fuzzies. Shoot for the bright ones. Uh, the Eagle Nebula, the Swan and the Lagoon Nebula, or 
all pretty bright. In fact, the, the Swan Nebula shows up incredibly well in even relatively short pictures. Okay? Uh, the Orion Nebula also is very bright. You can take a very short picture of the Orion, I'm saying like a minute or two minutes, and still get a pretty decent image. And it will have a lot of color in it too. <coughs> it's one of the advantages of, of cameras. You see the color that you don't see in light. Light globulars, you've got 13 Pleiades double cluster. Those are all relatively large, but you can still do them and, uh, and they're really nice and bright. And again, the nice part about these, they, you get the advantage of that uh, aperture related boost that we talked about in the very beginning. So they, these come out and appear brighter than, than they would appear visually for, a, for the same exposure that you would have here. I'm not saying that very well, but that's, that's been my experience. The, the clusters shine out, the individual stars shine brighter because you're not spreading that light over the sides. I'm moving on. <laughs> um, faint fuzzies, that's what's out there, guys. That's most of what we look at when we're, when we're doing this. My caution to you, if you're getting started in astrophotography, is don't start with these. Don't start taking your pictures. Now, I know you guys don't trust me, and you're going to start here. You're going to take these pictures, and that's fine. The point is, don't be disappointed that they don't come out as beautiful as you would like. Treasure them, learn from them, figure out what's wrong, what you need to do better. But remember what we went through to be able to take these pictures. We had all those lessons, all those problems that we had to solve, all that technology that we had to learn leading up to our ability to take these pictures. If you start here, you haven't solved all those other problems and you're going to have to solve them because they're the same problems that you have when you're shooting star trails as when you're shooting something like this. So start here if you want. I'm not going to throw you out of the club. Um, <laughs> start here if you want. But trust me, you're going to want to go back and you're going to want to learn some of these technologies, some of these techniques individually. And then when you come back here, you'll have all that technology solved and you'll be able to start on all those new technologies. What's different? You need a, you need a mount, telescope, camera. You're probably going to need dew heaters. We talked about that. Power source for the mount, guide scope. Uh, guide scope and auto guider is basically the, the main difference here. Um, mounts are, ph are physical things, and they have built-in imperfections. And you'll find there's a thing called periodic error that causes things to move. There's also declination drift if you're not properly polar aligned. If you put an auto guider on there, or if you want to guide visually, I've done that too. Put an auto guider on there. It doesn't solve all those problems, but it makes them much, much less apparent. If you're not properly polar aligned, you're going to get something called field rotation. But unless you're taking really long pictures, it's not going to be drastic. It's not going to be bad, or unless you're really off. And perhaps a couple of other things that you need to worry about. Um, you, guys, you guys got that? This is, roughly speaking, a short list of the things that I do when I get ready to take pictures. It takes me two hours from the time I put my tripod feet on the ground to the time I'm ready to take pictures. Um, but that's part of the fun of it. I'm a gadget freak. I, I like playing with, with the toys. And so a lot of those things that you have to do are, are just things you have to do. Solve the simple problems, because when you get here, you've got bigger problems to solve. All right, what could possibly go wrong with deep sky objects? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about it. What's wrong with that picture? It's the Eagle Nebula, by the way. There's, there you go. I got two things going on. I wasn't properly polar aligned, so I've got severe declination drift going this way. And then I've got periodic, periodic error as my mount is trying to keep track of the sky and that worm gear is turning and I keep getting errors because the worm gear is not perfect. None of them are. So I'm, get the, I'm getting the scope traveling back and forth. The next one I think is one of my favorite. <laughs> the same, same effect, but this one I call my McDonald's picture. Again, this is a scan of a print. And in the print, these, the color, oh, sorry. In a print, the, I'm going backwards. The colors of these stars just come out. There's a yellow one and a, and a, and a, and a red one, and there's a couple of blue ones in here somewhere. They're just beautiful. I really like this picture. I, I, I know it's not a good astrophotograph, but it shows up the color of the, of the stars so nicely. Focusing really works to get color. Yeah, yeah it one does. Coolest, because you're not saturating the pixels. One of the right. coolest shots. It's a great excuse. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. One of the coolest shots of Orion yeah. I've ever seen was one where uh, it was a fixed tripod, probably about a 50 millimeter lens, and they let it go for probably five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, but they slightly defocused the lens like once a minute. Mm -hmm. and so what you get is this nice blooming 
uh, of the star. So it looks almost like a as it trails along. As it trails along. Yeah. As it goes out of focus, uh, the colors were stunning, right? You got to get creative. A couple of different, beautifully different colored stars. You got to get creative and, and do like Microsoft does. It's not a fault, it's a feature. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, you guys didn't know this, but this is the Andromeda Galaxy, and we are, in fact, being invaded by a series of flying saucers coming from Andromeda. <laughs> now, what's wrong with this picture? Nope, same, same effect here as it is in the center, so it's not coma. Wind. Could be wind. Um, what I decided, what I discovered was wrong was my auto guider wasn't guiding properly. It was, it was, it was trying to chase the, um, the, the image of the star, and so it would go off in this direction, it would come back in this direction, and, and that's basically what happened. You want to talk about wind, <laughs> again, some declination drift in here, but the wind was heavy that night, I was bouncing all over the place. So you, you get to know what conditions you can and can't shoot in. Beautiful shot of the Lagoon Nebula, I was very proud of it, I, sh I looked at it and I went back to the guy who processed it and I said, you guys scratched my negative. No, I was, I was uh, used to be, we used to call it Savage Park, or Savage Farm up on the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it's right in the path of Dulles. And sure enough, this is a piece of sky about that big in the sky, and a plane flew right through my, through my field of view. Again, neat image, but one of those lessons that you learn. There I am, sometimes it goes well. I am down in the, Flor in the Winter Star Party down in the Florida Keys, having a wonderful time. I highly recommend anybody going to that if they want. Sometimes it goes well. Actually, that was taken here at uh, AHSP last year. It's the Helix Nebula. Um, this is where I get to brag. No, no, just a cam just a just a regular camera. I'm sorry. <clears throat> One of the points I meant to mench mention earlier and I didn't was that uh, replacing the filter in a DSLR with one that's more sensitive to the hydrogen alpha, that works tremendously. It makes it about 80% more sensitive to the hydrogen alpha frequency than the stock filters, the stock filters that come inside your camera. Send it off to Hutech, and there's a bunch of number of places that do it but it increases the hydrogen alpha sensitivity of your camera by 80% and it works really, really well. I'm sorry if I, made, I forgot to make that point. Did you do all that stuff with darks and flats? And yes. Darks, flats, I don't know whether I took biases, but again, you're, 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 the stars in the edge are, are pretty much as bright as the stars in the center, so I've gotten rid of the vignetting. There's no hot pixels, but yes, darks and flats. Um, speaking of flats, I brought a couple of things to show you how to, what you can use to take flats. Before the sun sets, you throw one of these things or even just a t-shirt over the top of your scope, point it up and uh, about 90 degrees away from where the sun is because you don't want polar, you don't want, you, you don't want sun setting effects to affect it so it's a relatively flat sky there. And throw one of these, throw this or a t-shirt over your, I'm going to pass those around, over your scope um, and you can take your flats with that. You want to take a flat so that your histogram, and you're far more experienced, but when I do it, I take a flat, put the histogram on the left-hand side of the histogram about 75% from the left-hand edge, so it's relatively bright. You're, you're not overfilling the pixels. You don't want any fully white pixels, but at the same time, you want as much signal in there as you can. And there is a science to talk about how you take flats that uh, sort of above my head, but if you just want to take a flat, huh? Yes, yes. Um, just get it so that the left-hand side of your histogram is about 75% across the thing. Or, or if you're lazy, you can just put the camera into AUV mode, aperture priority, and just let the camera figure it out. Oh, really? That's what I do all the time. Interesting. I haven't tried that. That at least corrects the thing you're getting Again, a picture I'm proud of. That was the supernova that appeared in M51. Um, that's Andromeda Galaxy. I've since taken much better pictures of Andromeda, but I didn't have time to put them in here, so we'll worry about that. Proud of the sequence of lunar transits. These things can go well. I'm sorry, Venus transits. I was all set up to get the one in 2012 and clouded out totally. So I didn't get the bookends. That's M13. Um, very nice image of M13, but then I went down to the Winter Star Party and I caught the picture of Alpha Centauri, Omega Centauri. And it's, it's huge, it's spectacular. It just blows, blows M13 away, which is, in my opinion, one of the best ones we can get around here. Is it the same image scale? The same image scale, yeah. It's about three times larger. Yeah. Um, 
This is a chain of galaxies, Markarian's chain. And if you blew this up, there's a whole bunch of faint fuzzies down in this region. Donna Blosser counted the numbers. She said she counted 30 galaxies in that, in that image. Again, quite happy with how these things came out. This was Rosette Nebula uh, down at the Winter Star Party. Um, okay, enough of my bragging here. Know your gear. Know what it can do. The only way you're going to do that is to get out there and take pictures. And that's the, the first step, the only step that matters. Um, get the basics right. Start at the beginning. Learn how to do all those things that you need to do. Because if you're going to take sophisticated astrof astrophotographs, you're going to have to solve those basic things first. You might as well solve the basic things taking basic pictures. Um, and I list some of those there. Hydro oh, I, I, did, I did have it in there. Hydrogen modified, hydrogen alpha modified cameras work. They do really well. Uh, it's a little more expensive. It can cost, in some cases, $500 above the list price of the camera. But if you're doing it and you're going to be taking hydrogen alpha pictures, it's worth it. Use filters where it helps. There's a whole theory or a whole, a whole other whole talk on how to use filters and when to use them. And learn how to post-process your pictures. Post-processing is essential. There's a picture I took here in April, I think it was. And I, you can just barely make it out. There's Andromeda and there's pan stars. And there's the horizon. And the horizon's tilted because I, I had it on my equatorial mount and I was tracking it. I was allowing, the, allowing it to follow the sky. <clears throat> well, that's a single image. And after I processed it, that's basically what comes out. And it's, it's a little washed out because of the light, but it basically is, is incredibly different. And that's just a series of about 30 images that I stacked and, and, and played with the contrast. So post-processing is essential. Learn how to do it. I'm not going to tell you that's not an introductory to astrof astrophotography, but it's an essential way to take pictures and have them turn into the quality of things that you see on the internet. Uh, there's another picture. <laughs> um, I think there's supposed to be some vignetting there. Yeah. Honestly, I don't remember what that's, what that's supposed to be. There's, there's, a, there's some vignetting around the sides, and after, after the vignetting, it all goes away and the star field is flat. That's, I guess, what I was trying to show. Yeah, could be. All right, share your pictures. Ask for help. Put your post, post your pictures on Novak and say, what do you think, guys? And nine out of ten times, fifty percent. Well, nine out of ten times, the responses you're going to get back are, "Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's great. Those are the wonderful to hear. It makes you feel a little warm and fuzzy." But those are the least helpful responses. <laughs> when someone posts a picture, give him some constructive criticism. Don't disappoint him. Don't don't make him discouraged. But give him some constructive criticism, even if you have to do it offline. Help him understand how to make his pictures better. And you do the same thing. Post your pictures and expect, even ask for, constructive criticism. Um, new equipment can be expensive, we all know that. Astromart, Cloudy Nights, good place to get used equipment. Resell what you don't need. I have the problem of not, having to, have, not happening to do that very often, so I still have this glut of material. If you, if you buy the equipment used and then you rent it, I'm sorry, you buy the equipment used and then you sell it, it's like you've rented the equipment for a couple of hundred bucks for however long you had it. It's not a bad, not a bad deal. Um, for those of you who are starting out in astrophotography, start a discretionary fund. Get together with your significant other and find out how much money you can put away every month to spend on your astronomy gear. If you don't do that, <laughs> you're, if you don't work, work with your significant other, that's, that's at your peril. Um, that's, that's at your risk. Gather new data, try out new procedures, test out new gear. My suggestion is I like to not buy my way out of a problem unless I really need to. If I've got a problem I can't solve, I'll try and try different techniques or different methods of using the device or something before I finally realize I need to go buy a new auto guider or a new filter or something. Because so many times there's equipment for sale out there that claims to do stuff and it doesn't always do the job as well as you'd like. Find a way around it before you make the decision. Don't buy yourself out of a problem. All right, want pretty pictures? Get them off the web. If you want to take great images yourself, you got to figure out what went wrong in your last image and make it better the next time. Your images should be a continuing, not each night, but a continuing series of better and better and better images. And that's kind of encouraging when you look at the images that you take now and you know they're not very good. If you keep at it and you keep trying to solve those problems, they will get better, okay?
Test, analyze, fix, and repeat. That's the way to do it. Don't buy your way out of a problem. I just already said that. I didn't realize that was there. And then sooner or later, you will get images you're proud to share. Um, these are some useful links. They'll be on the briefing presentation, which will be posted on the internet. Those tables that I showed you came from, um, my goodness. Yeah, I guess, I, well, the, one of the tables didn't come from these guys, but Jerry Lodrigues has a, a, a book out and a CDs out, but he also has some free hints on the internet. Sky and Telescope, Stargazing Basics, the links are there. I do apologize, you can't read them. Um, I, and then, of course, email me. I'm always happy to answer questions of anybody. Point is, there's my Nike swoosh. Just do it, okay? So you just get out there, just get out there and take the pictures, because that's the only way you're going to get any better at this, okay? All right. Thank you.